Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours that has certainly not been going on since the last video that you watched. Now, let's go take a look at the highest voted uh, uh, questions and jump right in. DBABA says, I have a complex nested view. Every time after DAC pack deployments, this view runs into timeouts for a couple of days. Okay, so here's the thing with that, though. Views don't have timeouts. Queries have timeouts. Queries that hit the views might have timeouts. But the thing that I'm going to challenge you on is when you say that the view has a timeout, I want you to copy paste the contents of the view out. And then I want you to put it in like as a CTE in with the query, get away from the view altogether and use it as a CTE and see if the query still times out. If the query still times out, it has nothing to do with the view. It may have con uh, uh, something to do with the T-SQL in the view. But if you want to learn more about that, search for Brent Ozar, your views are not the problem. Oh my goodness, it's showing me another ad break. It's back on the ads again? What on earth? I'm sorry about, well, I, I can apologize here, but it doesn't mean any good for the people who are watching the uh, uh, live video. So next up, Sean asks, is a buffer pool extension worth using if your storage is SSD anyway? No, absolutely not. If you want to learn more about that, search for Brent Ozar Buffer Pool Extensions, uh, 24 hours of pass. Quite a mouthful. Brent Ozar Buffer Pool Extensions, 24 hours of pass. And there was a vendor, a third party vendor, who put on a song and dance about how Buffer Pool Extensions were so awesome. And I debunked it just line by line. And then, thank goodness, the person who was moderating their session actually asked my questions to the presenters. Uh, and the presenters were forced to admit on camera that there weren't actually advantages to Buffer Pool Extensions. You're much better off putting more memory in the server than you are using buffer pool extensions. And even by the time you get to say 6428 gigs of RAM, buffer pool extensions are a dead road. Now, I say dead road because George typed in the thing Deadpool extensions and I immediately saw that and I was kind of wanting to chuckle there. Um, I will say I've had one client who swore that buffer pool extensions saved their life. And I didn't want to turn it off. I was just like, yep, if you think that saves your life, keep right on going. You can keep chugging right along. They were also an extremely smart client. So it might have been true. It wasn't true, but that's OK. Next up, Christopher Wallace asks, what is your opinion of using Azure Elastic SAN for hosting SQL VM data uh, files? I, if that's, I haven't heard the term Elastic SAN. I'm going to Google it. Because I think that that's a slang name for something else. Azure Elastic SAN. Um, no, Azure SAN is a cloud native SAN. Oh, introduction August 15th of 2013. It's in preview. So it's in preview. So my thing with stuff that's you know brand new out and in preview or whatever is I want to see it actually go to general availability. I've seen so many products where, not just from Microsoft, but from everywhere, where if they do a preview and then they limit it due to problems or they set the pricing at general availability and then all of a sudden everybody freaks out. So I would hold off until the thing actually goes generally available. I don't even bother learning technologies anymore when they're just in preview because I only have so many hours in the day. And I've seen Microsoft bring out some real stinkers where they looked vaguely appealing in preview and then they were horrific in general availability. I'll give you an example, uh, stretch tables. Uh, SQL Server came out with these stretch tables things that were supposed to put your archive data up in the cloud. And the pricing on them was so bad. Like the general idea of the feature made some sense. Version 1 sucked, but I'm like, I can kind of forgive that as long as it's vaguely adoptable and Microsoft will put money into it. It was terrible. It was absolutely awful when, they, when the pricing dropped. People are like, nobody's going to use that. I don't know if it's technically been deprecated or not yet, but they removed support for it from SQL Server Management Studio. And yeah. SQL Dev DBA says, excuse me, sir, do you have a moment for Synapse Power Fabric Data Lakehouse? And so that's a good point. Even when it goes general availability, it still may not even uh, last that long or stick around that much. 
Stanley asks, what is your opinion of using HammerDB for load testing prospective new SQL Server VMs? Unless you can reproduce your workload with HammerDB, what's the point? All you're learning is how that VM performs to someone else's workload. There's a perfect VM out there for every workload. The one that matters is yours. Start by doing backups, restores, and check DBs. Those are the quickly, the quickest, easiest ways to just get a rough idea of whether or not the VM uh, passes the sniff test. And I say that because very often people fail that. Like we go to do a restore on the new SQL Server and it's horrifically slower than the old SQL Server and I go, go fix that first. It doesn't make sense to do end user type load testing until we can even do backups and restores as quickly as we did on the old servers. Blue Tar Sky asks a question that I don't care about. I don't care at all. It says, what is your recommended naming convention? I couldn't care less because I don't believe in anyone's indexes. Now, I'll tell you, DK Kimbo says, missing name of missing index. I'll tell you what I do, which is just I use the columns that they're on. User ID, display name, location. I just use the columns that they're on with underscores. I don't put anything else in the front except under very specific circumstances like column store indexes. But otherwise, you know it's an index when you're looking at the execution plan. You know what table it's on. Why would you bother putting the table name or the index or the uh, fact that it's an index at the beginning when it's right there in the execution plan? It says table name dot schema name dot index name or no, it says schema name dot table name dot index name. You don't need to put the table name in there twice and we only have so many pixels before they break it off. So just Go with the bare minimum. Name it with exactly what it is. Next up, G Surgeon, who's in the house today. G Surgeon says, if I have a table with a composite primary key on column one, column two, which is also the clustered index, does it ever make sense to have a non-clustered index on column one? The rare use case, and I'm, I'm talking rare, the rare use case is if you said select count distinct column one. In that case, you need column one sorted, and you need it on as few pages as practical. That's a range scan across lots of column ones, and it'll end up going much faster if you build a separate index for that. Now, I would argue as a good database administrator that people should not be running regular queries of count distinct on column one. That points towards something that we should probably do as a, uh, a caching layer on the front end of the application. Um, DK Kimbo says if it was an index on column two, DK Kimbo could believe it, and I agree. An index on column two would make much more sense and be much more common, but an index on column one alone is fairly rare. Uh, let's see, next up we have Danielle. Danielle says, is there a good way to determine if a given query or query plan was the result of a plan guide? Yes, uh, it's in the plan's properties. If you right click on the select, like select, insert, update, delete, when you're looking at the plan, click on the root node, right click on that and go into properties. And it's one of the properties in there. I can't remember what the name is, if, if it's like plan equals forced or something, but it's in one of the properties. The easiest way to see it is probably to go open query store, look at the report queries with forced plans, and then you should be able to see there. A DK Kimbo says, does that also tell you if it's pinned from query store? That I don't know. I don't know if it's different based on whether it's using a plan guide or whether it's using query store, like originated from query store. No clue, because it could also be automatic tuning would be another way that uh, you could end up with a forced plan. No clue, but that's where I would start. Next up, Gonzo asks, uh, what are your pros and cons of Management Studio versus Azure Data Studio? When should you choose one over the other? Database administrators, people who 
manage SQL Server should use, I'll give you one guess, Management Studio. People who do everything else should probably try Azure Data Studio. Don't feel bad if it isn't for you. If it isn't for you and you don't like it, totally no problem. I like it in the sense that it works well on Macs. I run an Apple Mac with uh, Apple Silicon processors, so it's much easier for me to run Azure Data Studio. I also work a lot with Postgres, uh, so it's easier for me to use that. I would tell people to try Azure Data Studio because if it's things like its source code integration, uh, I think it's a little cleaner in terms of working across multiple databases. Uh, you could run Management Studio plus something else, but if you just want to run one app to get your job done. The, the query plans aren't quite as nice if you're used to Management Studio, um, but uh, yeah, that, that's how I would break it out there. DK Kimbo says if you use Polybase, Azure Data Studio is super helpful. That totally makes sense. Oh, Surly Dev is here. Oh, Surly Dev, good to see you. Ha ha ha, Merrill, sa Merrill asks, what are your pro tips for combating seasickness and jet lag? Okay, they're separate. For seasickness, get those armbands. They make these, uh, I think they're called C bands. They make these armbands, they look like uh, sweatbands, and they have a little acupuncture pressure point in them that you align at a specific place on your wrist. You wear them on both wrists. It doesn't work with everyone, but it works with a lot of people. I'm amazed by how well they work. Second, use Dramamine or whatever the, the third party replacement is, the generic replacement in your country. Uh, Dramamine is fantastic. It does make you sleepy and you shouldn't drink alcohol when you're on it. But the thing that I say to my friends who are getting on their first cruise ships is I say, look, I know you're going to want to get on there and get drunk and have a good time, but wouldn't you rather just have a good time? Avoid seasickness. Dramamine is, is absolutely your friend. Once you've got your sea legs and you've been on a few cruises, you'll have a feel for whether or not you need Dramamine and the armbands. I no longer do, but I tell you what, I went on my uh, Nordic cruise and there were people vomiting in the hallways. It was so bad. Uh, it was a lot of rock and roll seas out in the North Sea, and uh, I, I can see why people got seasick there. The second part of it was combating jet lag. So because I travel a lot, I'm, I'm kind of brutal with this. Go to sleep when you're tired. When you're not tired, stay up. That sounds kind of dumb, right? But the thing is, if you wake up in your hotel at 10 p.m. and you're awake, don't fight it. Just go be awake. Be awake, read, be productive, work for whatever. You're going to fall asleep in no time you will wake up and you'll be like, all right, I guess I might as well write some blog posts and do some emails. And next thing you know, you're going to be like, oh, God, I can't stay awake. It works for me every time. Like, I'll just be like, all right, let's do this. And I don't take a shower. Like, I won't wake up and take a shower because I know once I take a shower, I'm up for good. Richie says, remembering the cruise that I took with Brent and there was muchos alcohol involved. Because especially back in the older days, I would drink profusely and I just assumed no one else would have seasickness problems. And uh, it's, the people do. Uh, DK Kimbo says, someone told us it takes you one day to recover for every hour difference from your home time zone. For me, I think it's closer to one day to recover for every two to three hours of time zones. Um, also, it's kind of luck of the draw, too. Like, I flew over from, uh, come back from, like, the border of Russia all the way to the United States. I jumped, I think, nine time zones. Um, and uh, I recovered the next day. I was totally okay because I timed it out and just slept uh, leading up to it, slept when I was tired and was awake when I was awake. So it was easier for me to just sync up with the body clock. Also, I get up at crazy times anyway, so that makes it kind of uh, bizarre. Uh, Pete asks, ping me, please. I try to watch all the office hours, but I do miss a few. It would be nice if we get notified that our question was covered. So the problem with that is there's two parts. One is when the question is answered live on the stream. The other part is when it goes live on YouTube. Yet another part is when it goes live on my blog. All three of those are different dates. 
So it would be kind of hard for me to coordinate that and send out emails across uh, the board, especially when once it's out of PollGab, the, the schedule that PollGab knows about is totally different than the schedule that goes out on YouTube and blogs. This is something that I've thought about, and I didn't delete this question because I was like, this, uh, this is important and I've thought about it, but I just don't know how to get across that finish line just yet. DK Kimbo says Brent runs on Brent time in any time zone. It's true. I like I, I go over to went over to Norway, Sweden, and I was up at 3 a.m. I was up at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., just like I was back at home. And we'll do one more. Ricardo asks, is there any way that I can throttle I.O. for a specific login in standard edition? No. And let me ask why you would want to do that. Because what you're doing is holding locks open longer and holding memory grants open longer. Generally speaking, once we dig into that and we look at what the query is doing, people say, well, it's a really bad query and I don't mind if it takes forever. Right, but really bad queries, they also do blocking and they get big, huge memory grants. So that makes it kind of tough. All right, that's it for this episode of Office Hours. I am now going to probably go downstairs and go switch cars in and out of the living room. I, when I have a, I have a car in my dining room, and I different times of the year I'll back it out and switch a different car in in its place, and uh, have a uh, you know little ramps outside to make the process easier. I literally drive them in and out of the front door, get big French doors. Today will be a little exciting because I have artificial grass for the first time. And I'm not sure how it's going to work when I drive a car up the artificial grass. I'm worried about that uh, kind of like grabbing hold of the grass and causing problems. Surly Devs has a car in the dining room. Yes, if you go to my Instagram, there are pictures of them. I take pictures when I move cars in and out of there. There's also a video from like six months ago, the last time I did the switch. Um, but very fun, really enjoy it. DK Kimbo says, do you sit in it in your house? I don't, but other people do all the time. Whenever we have visitors, people will sit in the car and do Photoshop, photo shoots. They'll do like they're driving because they have a hilarious time with it. Um, we, you know, kids get in there and, and uh, sit around in it. We even, if we need to keep the dog somewhere, we will put the dog in there temporarily, like if we're moving things around the house and the dog is completely happy. DK Gimbo says, make an indoor drive-in theater. We thought about that, too. Uh, we were going to put a big TV right in front of the car so that you could sit in there and watch TV. But we already have a home theater with a giant TV. We have uh, four other TVs in the house. I think three other TVs? Three other TVs in the house. And we don't watch any of them except the big giant home theater and the one right in front of the uh, kitchen when uh, Eve cooks. So really says projector TV. We have a 150 inch uh, TV or uh, projector in the uh, home theater. And that's what I used to play Dead by Daylight most of the time, which is tons of fun. Actually, I kind of want to do that. That would be kind of fun today. All right. So thanks for hanging out with me today. And I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios, folks.